What is up you guys and welcome back to my channel featuring Queen Pumpkin. You guys seem to really enjoy her in my last video. You actually said it kind of brought this calming element to a very distressing story. So I figured since she didn't wreak any havoc on any of my equipment and she helps you guys consume this information and not feel as kind of stressed out about it or anxious, I would just let her peacefully sleep in the background. So today we're going to be speaking about the absolute senseless murder of 17 year old Amir Siddiqui. It is such a devastating and tragic story. It is something that never ever should have happened. And while there is definitely justice in this case, there is still one man that is involved that is at large. He is considered one of Wales most wanted men and no one has any idea where he is right now. So obviously the best thing that we can do in this sort of situation is share this story, share this man's face so that hopefully he can finally be captured and face what he's done. But before I get into the details of today's case, I need to thank Audible for partnering with me on today's video. You guys know how much I love Audible. They are the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and I think I have officially managed to get my entire family hooked. Hundreds of podcasts, audiobooks, audible originals, and more under dozens of different genres. There is something for everyone. Whether you want to sit down in a bath and relax listening to a romance novel or maybe a fiction novel, true crime, or if you just want to educate yourself on an unfamiliar topic, there is going to be something for you. Audible is great to listen to while you're in the car, while you're working out, while you're cleaning the house. My kids also love to turn on Audible and listen to audiobooks while they're winding down for the night. And with everything you love to listen to on one app that's super easy to access, you honestly cannot get much better than that. Audible also offers their members more than ever now with their all new plus catalog that contains thousands of audiobooks, Audible originals, guided meditation, their sleep tracks. All of this is just included with your membership. You give their members one credit every single month, good for any title under the premium selection. Now I am currently listening to Seven Bones by Peter Seymour and Jason Foster, and it is known as one of the most bizarre murder investigations in Australia, and it gives me big Kathleen Peterson vibes. The whole audiobook revolves around this one man whose first wife mysteriously disappeared. He then went on to marry his first wife's cousin, who is later found strangled in her bed. Now he's claiming nothing's going on. He just has experienced really bad luck, but obviously there's a whole lot more to the story. I don't want to give too much away, but I will say that the first wife did not actually go missing. Hard to believe. I know. Reel yourself in. But I actually have not finished the audiobook yet. So I thought it might be fun if we finish it together. So if you want to do that with me, go to audible.com forward slash Danielle or text Danielle to 500 500 right now to get one free audiobook, a 30 day free trial, of course, access to the all new plus catalog. And we can figure out what on earth happens in seven bones. Thank you again to audible for partnering with me on today's video. What brands like audible that work with my channel and support my channel so consistently allow me to create this content for you guys and these families and victims and allow me to donate as much as I possibly can to help in their efforts looking for their loved one or getting justice for their loved one. Now on to the details of today's case. Mir was a great young man. And when I did all of my research into this case, it's not just that like, oh, people didn't say anything negative about him. Like people went above and beyond when speaking about him. Everyone that had the pleasure of meeting him, even if it was just for a few moments during his time on earth, came forward to share their positive experience with him. He had such a huge impact on everyone that was lucky enough to have him in their life. Amir was well liked. He was very, very well behaved. There's no telling what he could have accomplished had his life not been taken from him. He was described by those that knew him as intelligent, gifted, kind, fun. He was humorous and he was also very caring. He was competitive. He loved to have fun and he had this ability to bring out the best in anyone. From a very early age, it was clear that Amir was gifted and he continued to excel and academics as he got older. He knew so much about everything. He knew everything there was to know about politics and music, history, religion, sports. He attended Cardiff High School and also attended Cardiff Academy, which I guess is like this independent college level type of school from my understanding for gifted students ages 14 
through 18, and then just prior to his death, he was accepted into Cardiff University, where he planned to study law. And a case of mistaken identity led to his untimely death. On Sunday, April 11th, 2010, Amir was at his home at 110 Ninian Park Road in Cardiff, and he had lived at this house his entire life. It was a nice community, and that day was a typical Sunday in the Siddiqui household. Amir's parents were relaxing around the house. He was working on his A-levels, and his sister, Miriam decided because he'd been studying so hard that she was going to head out and grab a mere lunch kind of as this little reward. Now, typically on Sunday, an imam would come over at around 3 p.m. to give Amir his Quran lesson, but on this particular Sunday, for some reason, the imam could not be there at 3 o'clock, so the lesson was scheduled to be a little bit earlier, I believe sometime around 2 o'clock. So just before 2 p.m. that day, there was a knock on the family's door, and Amir's mom, Parveen, quickly kind of glanced over towards the door and was able to see the outline of a man standing there, and it appeared as if he kind of threw this square cloth over his shoulder. And she believed that it was the imam coming for the Quran lesson, so she called Amir down to answer the door. But something awful was waiting on the other side. The moment Amir opened that front door, he was face to face with not just one man, but two men that were high on heroin. They had not thrown a small square of fabric over their shoulder, but had actually put balaclavas over their face in an attempt to cover them and hide their identities. And within moments of them realizing the door had been opened and greeting Amir, both men began according to his father, howling like animals, pulled out daggers, and then started to attack Amir in his own home, stabbing him repeatedly. Hearing the chaos, Amir's father, Iqbal, ran down to attempt to grab one of the attackers. I do believe he managed to grab one of them by the arm, but at this point, they had already stabbed Amir multiple times and his torso and were now stabbing Amir's father, trying to get him out of the way. Amir's dad had just had knee replacement surgery, so he was a little bit weaker, and despite his best efforts, these two younger men managed to overtake him. They slashed him multiple times and threw him to the side. Parveen also tried to stop this attack on her son by jumping onto the backs of one of these attackers, but just as Iqbal, she ended up being thrown off to the side. I believe one of the attackers had managed to kind of chase Amir into the living room of the home, but once he kind of slumped down onto the ground, both men ran from the house, jumped into a Volvo, and sped off. Parveen frantically ran to the street after she just witnessed her son being stabbed multiple times after being stabbed multiple times herself and began to scream for someone to come and help her. Now, thankfully, because it was kind of the middle of the day on a Sunday, there were two young girls that were walking around the neighborhood. And when they heard these screams, they ran to the closest person that was out walking. It happened to be a man named Ian Nurse. And they said, look, we're two young girls. We hear someone screaming. We don't know how to help. Will you please go into the Siddiqui home and figure out what exactly is going on? So Ian Nurse went to the Siddiqui home, followed the screams from Amir's mother, and basically walked into a devastating, bloody mess. Blood was all over everything. Both Parveen and Iqbal were covered in blood, and Amir was laying unresponsive in the middle of the floor. And within just a few minutes, Officer Stuart Wales arrived on the scene. When Stuart Wales arrived, he vividly remembers Parveen kind of throwing back the curtains in one of the windows in the home. And she was trying to see, obviously, who was there, but he says he will never get the image of her face out of his mind because it was just this look of pure pain and devastation. And she had so clearly been traumatized by whatever had occurred in the house. And once he finally went in and saw the reality of it all, he understood exactly why she looked the way that she did. He said, quote, I have 17 years of police service and there's no doubt about it. It was the most distressing incident I've ever had to attend. So while he is trying to figure out what exactly was happening, Officer Ki Wong also arrived on scene and began to perform CPR on Amir for 20 minutes waiting for the ambulance to come. Once the ambulance arrived, Amir was loaded in and taken to the Hospital of Wales, but ultimately he ended up dying from the brutal attack. Amir's parents also received medical attention. Both of them had been stabbed multiple times in the arm and the chest and the head, but they were thankfully able to recover from their 
wounds. Police, however, at this point were entirely stuck. There was no clear motive in this entire case. The Siddiqui family was well-liked. They never caused any issues. They had absolutely no enemies. No one had any idea why the Siddiqui's or Amir would have been targeted for any sort of reason. Obviously, robbery wasn't a motive because these men came in, attacked, and then left. They didn't try to take anything. They didn't act like that was ever their intentions. The community was also horrified because there was no obvious motive. People were scared that there were simply some deranged individuals out there that would tear down your door howling like wild animals and try to quite literally butcher your entire family. I cannot imagine what that would have felt like for anyone living in that surrounding area. But the police attempted to assure the community over and over again that they were not in danger. They strongly believed there was something else going on below the surface of all of this. Because there was so much in question in this case, police and the Siddiqui family decided to hold a press conference to try to bring forward individuals that may have some sort of information on the attackers, on who killed Amir Siddiqui. The police even offered a 10,000 pound reward to anyone that could help identify the murder. And thankfully, this ended up bringing forward helpful information that brought to light the tragic reality of this murder. Police had given out a description of the men because both of Amir's parents quite vividly remembered what they were wearing and what they looked like despite having their faces covered. A man named Zaid Akbar called the police after hearing the description of the two men that attacked Amir and his parents and he said that he believed the two men had come into his family store early that Sunday morning. His mother who had been working in the store that morning also heard the descriptions of the two men and agreed that she believed they came in. He claimed that they asked her if there was any tape or gloves that they could buy while in the store, but from my understanding, she didn't have any, so they just left with a pack of cigarettes. Because Zaid was so convinced that these two men were in fact the ones that came into the store, he went through his own CCTV footage and managed to capture images of both of the men and help hand them over to police to see if this was in fact a match. And sure enough, they fit the description. Both of these men were easily identified by police because they were well known by police. They were 39-year-old Ben Hope and 38-year-old Jason Richards. Both Ben and Jason have very lengthy and violent criminal histories and both of them are known for using heroin. They both had received charges in their past for assaulting police officers, assaulting women. I mean, you name it, it's probably on their criminal history. And because they had so many unfortunate things in common, I guess when they ultimately met while in jail, they hit it off right off the bat. And once they both were released, their twisted relationship just continued. They would use drugs together, they would sell drugs together, and apparently they would also murder together. So within days of the attack, both men were arrested. But this really didn't answer many questions still. Police had the men that they believed attacked Amir, but they could not find any connection between these men and the Siddiqui family. When the men were arrested, Ben apparently kept on just handing over details of the case without even being asked. He was clearly very upset and frantic. I guess while on the way to the police station in the back of the cop car, he repeatedly blamed Jason for the murder, said Jason did this. I had nothing to do with it. You know, Jason was the mastermind behind all of this. And when they even got to the police station, Ben asked the police if they knew anything about the car yet. While police did know that both of the men jumped into a Volvo to flee the scene, Ben essentially ended up giving them the rest of the information that they needed that this Volvo had in fact been a stolen vehicle. And according to Ben, Jason parked it by the Adamstown Bridge after the murder. And I guess Jason said that he wanted to either burn it or change the plates on it. Now, while Ben was just out here spewing tons of information towards authorities without even being asked for it. Jason on the other end totally denied being involved in the killing at all, acted like he didn't know anything. And ultimately both men were charged for the murder of Amir Siddiqui and attempted murder of Amir's parents. Despite being arrested and charged, they still were no closer to understanding why exactly these men came to the Siddiqui home that day. So the investigation ended up being a pretty lengthy one. It involved footage from over 100 to 120 different surveillance cameras in the area, and that alone gave them a lot of the different bits of evidence that they needed. The police basically tracked both of the men and their whereabouts through all of the CCTV footage in the area the days prior to the murder. They were able to see footage of this stolen Volvo all around Cardiff. Jason Richards himself was also seen on foot and, you know, traveling by bus prior to the murder. 
They, through this footage, were also able to find multiple different drug deals that the men had been a part of. And then on April 9th, when they looked through the different phone records of both Ben and Jason, they found that Jason had pretty consistent communication with a man named Muhammad Ali Ege. Around the same time that there were these text messages between Jason and Muhammad, CCTV also captured one of the meetings, and I believe this may have even been considered a drug deal at first, um, but it was between Jason and another individual, and essentially police put the puzzle pieces together that this was actually a murder for hire plot. These men had been hired to kill someone, but why Amir? So during further investigations, they ended up finding out that this actually had nothing to do with Amir at all. Muhammad had recently had a falling out with a man over a property deal. I guess things went bad, he lost out on a lot of money, and he was very upset about this. And apparently this man that he was having issues with lived just one street over from the Siddiqui household. So Muhammad angrily got in touch with these two heroin dealers who he knew he'd be able to pay to murder this man for him, but on this high that they were on, they went to the wrong house and ended up killing 17-year-old Amir Siddiqui. Police were successfully able to locate the car thanks to the ramblings of one of these men, and it was sent in for forensic testing. Inside the car, they were able to confirm that they found Amir's blood, as well as the fingerprints from both Ben and Jason. Then, while they were pouring over more of the CCTV footage to kind of figure out what happened after the fact, they found that within two hours of the murder, Ben was wandering around Cardiff with a big envelope stuffed with money. He purchased himself sneakers, a laptop, and a few other small things. Literally hours after he came into someone's house howling like a wild animal and stabbed him with daggers, this man is out buying himself new shoes. So at this point, authorities had everything they felt they needed to have. They had evidence from the car, they had both of these men in custody, and they had Muhammad Ali Ege, who clearly set up this entire murder for hire plot. So they next wanted to go after him, but unfortunately, Muhammad knew that this was coming and he had fled the country. Alerts were sent out internationally and an arrest warrant for Muhammad was active in the UK and they hoped because it was so close to the time that Amir had been killed literally within days that there's no way he would have been able to travel very far. If he used his passport, someone would know. Everyone literally around the world, a flag should have gone up had he tried to go anywhere, but unfortunately that just never happened and their search efforts to find him just kept coming up fruitless. By September 2010, police decided they needed a little bit of help, so they offered a 10,000 pound reward to anyone that could help locate Muhammad, and prosecutors continued to build their case against both Ben and Jason. And then finally, the breakthrough that they had been waiting for. In October of 2011, Muhammad was arrested in India on suspicion of conspiracy to commit murder. They had finally found him. It hadn't even taken as long as they thought it would, considering he could have been pretty much anywhere in the world World, but unfortunately, things would not go as planned. So when Muhammad was arrested, he had three different IDs on him, and this kind of gave a glimpse into how he was able to stay hidden for as long as he had. He also had multiple passports on him. His Indian passport that he had on him was issued February 2011, and it was under the name Abdul Malik, and he had a birthday, I believe, on this passport of October 21st, 1979. He also had a British passport. I believe it was under the same name, Abdul Malik, and this time it gave a birthday of November 22nd, 1977. He also had an entirely separate birth certificate under the name of Abdul Jabbar, an income tax card under the name of Abdul Malik, and it was also found that he used an alias of Muhammad Abdul Karim. So he had gone by multiple different aliases. He had managed to get himself tax cards, birth certificates, passports, IDs, all of these different things. And so this is how he had successfully been able to travel anywhere he needed to go without raising any suspicion from anyone. Now, unfortunately, if you've watched any of my previous videos, I've spoken before on the justice system in India. It is very, 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 very slow. Uh, and unfortunately, because of this, authorities in Wales knew that it was likely going to be a while before they would be able to extradite Muhammad back to the UK. 
On top of that, India had filed their own charges. As I said, he had originally been arrested on suspicion of conspiracy to commit murder, um, but they actually also got him for passport and identity forgery because of all the falsified documents on him. So Muhammad was going to have to face those charges first. So in the meantime, they decided to continue to focus their efforts on Ben and Jason. Now, finally, they went to trial in the UK, I believe, either towards the end of 2012 to the very early months of 2013. The entirety of both of their trials, they just honestly didn't seem like they cared at all. They blamed each other for what happened. Ben, the entire trial, blamed Jason. Jason said no, Ben had everything to do with this. And both of them refused to admit any sort of wrongdoing or their involvement at all, despite all of this evidence found. And finally, on February 1st, 2013, both men were found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 40 years. Justice Roy stated after sentencing that what these men did was brutal savage and callous and that if either of them died in jail, few would shed a tear and many would believe that it was well deserved. Jason immediately tried to appeal his conviction, but it was denied. And then shortly after this, both Ben and Jason attempted to at least appeal their sentences. But by June of 2014, the Court of Appeals denied both of them. They stated that this kind of brutal premeditated contract killing, the way that they acted this out, the way that they murdered this young man in front of his own parents has absolutely no place in civilized society and that they both were fairly charged and sentenced and needed to basically just get over themselves. Amir's family went to both Ben and Jason's trial and they were absolutely thrilled, obviously, with the verdict. This is what they had been hoping for. They did not want these two men to ever have the opportunity to harm anyone ever again, but they still wanted to see Muhammad be brought to justice. This was just one piece of the puzzle that was missing and had it not been for Muhammad, their son would still be alive. Finally, in 2017, Muhammad was going to court for his charges in India. He had been held in a central jail, and I'm probably going to totally butcher the name of this, but Hyderabad. I think that's how you pronounce it, Hyderabad. And he was moved from there to Delhi in April of 2017 for his court proceedings. Now, when the proceedings were finally over, Muhammad was supposed to be transported back to Hyderabad uh, by train. And he was going to wait there in the central jail where he had been this whole time to be extradited back so that he could finally be extradited back to the UK. The escort team in charge of transporting Muhammad managed to get him to Hazrat Nizamuddin railway station. And once they got him there, they were holding him in this government police railway room. It was a secure place for him to wait until the final little stretch of his trip. Now, during this time, Muhammad asked to use the restroom and obviously the escort team allowed this and he was able to privately do so. But after a few minutes, he never came out. So his escort team looked into the bathroom and found that he had escaped by removing the grills off of the window. They were this close, 2011 to 2017, and they were finally about to extradite him and he freaking escaped. Police were alerted all over again internationally and locally in hopes that they could find him right away. And they were very hopeful at first. They had taken away all of his passports. They had taken away all of his IDs. They did not believe he'd be able to escape very far without them finding him. But unfortunately, here we are today and Muhammad has still not been found. Authorities have searched as well as they possibly can. I know that senior detective Wales, who initially had been on the case, is still on it and he is dedicated to finding Muhammad. Uh, but unfortunately, they believe it's possible that he could be anywhere all over again. UK Crime Stoppers has come forward and stated multiple locations that they believe Muhammad has ties to, including Dubai, um, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia. He obviously could be in India. He could be somewhere possibly in the UK, although I doubt he would go back there personally. But they believe he could have traveled even further than this because they think it's possible there's someone financially helping him. So when they initially found all of these different IDs and passports, the quality of them suggested that a lot of money was paid for him to get these and he would not have had the ability to get that sort of money. And this is what leads them to believe there's someone out there that knows exactly where he is or at least knows how to get in contact with him to support him financially. Just this past April, they released new photos of him. 
Um, I guess they just had not released these yet because the photos themselves are not new. There have been absolutely no sightings of him that have been reported to police or at least that police have publicly spoken about. Um, but these new photos they have released are simply photos of Muhammad when he was in custody in India in 2013. And I will display these here. But unfortunately, Muhammad is a little sneaky fella and has managed to attempt changing his appearance multiple times. I honestly think he does not do the greatest job at it, which fortunately means that he likely hasn't changed very much visually. He has shaved off all of his hair, shaved his beard, changed his facial hair. He is very clearly wearing wigs in some of the pictures that have been found of him. So he does go to some sort of lengths to change up his appearances to hopefully fly under the radar. However, again, I think no matter what, he still looks like the exact same person to me with just a little bit of tweaks. So hopefully sharing his photos can help. Now, unfortunately, these last photos were in 2013. So that means it has almost been a decade since this man has had any sort of photo taken of him, anything like that done. So age itself could have done something at this point. I believe he'd be in his 40s. And so there's a huge chance he's aged quite a bit. But I feel like at this point, he had to have settled down somewhere. From my understanding, there's still an active warrant. There is still an alert out internationally for him. But if he's traveling under false names, different aliases, there is no telling if those are actually going to be beneficial. Amir's family has waited very patiently to hopefully find this man so that they can have some sort of peace. They said that there is this closure that comes with both Ben and Jason being put away, but they cannot fully be at peace or rest or have full closure without knowing the man behind all of this is also put away. Because he so easily did this to someone who upset him when a business deal went wrong, there's also no telling if he's gone on to hurt anyone else, especially if he feels that, you know, his identity being put out there or, you know, something involved with him running is being put at risk by someone. I have never heard about this case before. I have never seen this man's picture before. And so I felt like most of you probably have not either. Putting this man's picture out there get it as far and wide as you can. It's literally as easy as one share to get it to an entirely different country. And that can make all of the difference in this case. So please go to any of the links I have down below that have Muhammad's information on it and share whatever you can so that hopefully it can make a difference and finally bring this dangerous man to justice. I'm honestly blown away by the Siddiqui family and how they have handled this entire situation. Um, it was traumatic for them and I cannot imagine having to deal with that trauma after the fact. Uh, and especially his sister, Miriam, who had been with him just moments earlier before he was killed. She did an interview, she did a TED talk where she spoke about the events of that day and one thing that I thought was very, very important and that I feel like I learned a lot from and took a lot from was she spoke on her trauma and the things that she was experiencing while this was happening, you know, the emotion she was experiencing afterwards, the different ways that she dealt with her trauma. And I feel like it is so important for anyone who consumes true crime to listen to what she has to say. And fortunately, many of us, most of us actually that listen to this kind of content that consume true crime, we've never experienced something like this ourselves. Most of the time, those that are affected, you know, they don't want to have to speak about it and I don't blame them. And so the fact that Miriam was able to come forward and speak about what she went through and the different ways she overcame a lot of the trauma and, you know, the fact that she went to get help and all of these different things that she explains in her TED talk, I just feel like it's very beneficial as a viewer of my channel and other true crime content. It just gives a perspective that I feel like you don't see very often in true crime. And I speak with dozens of families all the time about what they have been through. And I always tell you guys what I come away with after I have those conversations and the things that I learn and the way it makes me view my life and the way that I consume true crime content and put out true crime content. And this is kind of one of those times where you're able to have a piece of that because she's offered that to the world. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. I need to say a huge thank you to you guys for taking the time out of your day to listen to Amir's story. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.